Hello and welcome to Cross the Line, questions for the 19th the Congress of the Communist Party of China. I'm Yang Rei in Beijing. For our viewers, both at home and abroad, the upcoming 19th Congress of the CPC is no doubt an event that invokes a lot of curiosity. To address that curiosity, I'll be joined by our outstanding overseas correspondents to co-host the show today. They'll bring us questions and perceptions of the event from a, a completely foreign angle. To answer these questions and interpret these perceptions, we are joined in the Beijing studio today by Professor Zha Daojun from Peking University. And in London, our co-host Richard Bastig uh, cannot wait to tell us uh, what questions he's going to raise for this edition of the Cross the Line. From this end in the UK capital, I want to investigate the origins of what the world now regards as the Chinese economic miracle and where we are with it now. We take for granted the policy of opening up and economic reform, but it wasn't always so. To help me put it into some kind of perspective, I turn to the co-founder of Seven Investment Management here in London, Justin Urquhart-Stewart. Justin's not just one of London's leading financial experts. He's also an enthusiastic economic historian. He says what we've witnessed in China in the last three decades bears comparison to some of the truly great events of the last 200 years. Have a listen. What we've seen with China is its own industrial revolution, just as we saw in America, just we saw as we saw in Britain. But at three times the speed, it has been quite astonishing what China has achieved, just in the space of two decades, uh, which, uh, frankly, when we go back to that stage, no one would have thought was possible. Mm. What it's done is not just to lift 600 million Chinese out of poverty, but really to transform the lives of millions of people around the world, hasn't it? What you've seen with China is the astonishing impact it's had globally, because not only has it been in a position where it has actually industrialised itself, the impact it's had on that industry has been felt by every other nation in the world, no matter of what wealth, um, whether it's the developed Western nations, who've now had access to incredibly cheap, productive goods, uh, through to other nat poorest nations of the world who benefit from investment from China going in there as well. So all of this has happened. So there is not a country in the world which has not been touched by the development of China. So from the perspective of the City of London, the paramount uh, financial centre in Britain, how does it affect the day-to-day -day work of people like yourselves? China has a huge impact on what we do. In terms of uh, running people's money, we at Seven will actually look at people's portfolios, whether you've got a thousand pounds or whether you've got several million pounds. The effect of China in terms of what's happening with commodity prices, share prices, bond markets around the world means that it's not just a matter of investing in China, but on the effect of China everywhere else. So if we're investing just in the United Kingdom, Chinese policy will have an effect on that as well. So we watch very closely, and those that don't will be those that will be missing out. Mm, so over the last couple of decades, what we've seen is regarding China and the Chinese economy as a peripheral issue to everyone becoming a China watcher. Everybody has to be a China watcher. They have to stare at China, and frankly, I'm surprised that what's happened. They'll be staring in disbelief as to actually what has been going on. But you need to look at not just what's happening in China, but the effect of China as well. And that's what uh, ripples around the world, and therefore will affect every single citizen, and with their investments, their pensions, and their future. Now, the former Paramount leader, Deng Xiao, credit for this. But the reality is, the revolution of the last couple of decades could never have been planned. And I would imagine it's as much a, a surprise to the leadership of China as it is uh, to uh, those of us outside. Yes, because when you go back and you actually look at the statements of the leadership prior to Deng Xiaoping, there was no indication, there was no plan for this to occur at all. So I suspect it was actually a very brave move to open this lid and actually see what was going to come out of this magic pot. Um, and then, could you control it? And the Chinese have been able to control and develop this and has raised the value uh, of not only the nation, but also the benefits to the people themselves, and I would actually say to the rest of the world. After all, Look what China has been involved in in the past decade. Here we stand now at the 10th anniversary of the financial crash where the Western economies, their banks, were on their knees. And what was the one nation at that moment that was willing to invest, go on the front foot, and actually grow the economy and thus have an effect on the global economy? And that was China. 
And this recovery could not have been done without the Chinese participation and investment. We well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Richard, for bringing us uh, that uh, uh, meaningful part of the dialogue in London. Uh, welcome back to the Beijing studio. They were discussing the Chinese leadership as well as uh, the global impact of the Chinese economic miracle, quote unquote. Uh, now, they were also discussing the role that the uh, late paramount leader Deng Xiaoping played as the architect of China's modernization campaign, starting from the end of the Cultural Revolution onward. Now, what do you think of? Uh, the uh, influence that China delivers to the world in terms of uh, commodity prices, RMB, overcapacity, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, high speed railway, you, may, you, you name it. So, w what actually are your thoughts? Well, the uh, 19th Party Congress is a time for us to reflect here in China about how we have come to this stage of time. It's m also a time for us to relate to the rest of the world and reflect on how we can better connect with the rest of the world. Uh, when I was listening to the previous interview, um, people, especially when I hear uh, commentators, observe, uh, including China watchers, that talk about the China miracle, I cannot resist but thinking the only thing that was truly different that happened in China was a matter of scale. Uh, if you look at the history in this part of the world, what the, we did here in China, beginning in the area mid-1970s, was a continuation of what uh, other societies, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, you know, these uh, economies, and Southeast Asia. Um, but here in this country, because we had a big, huge uh, labor pool, and that dragged down the uh, cost, per unit cost of labor. So it's the scale that surprised everyone. But the now Size does matter. Size doesn't matters. matters. But now the uh, same quote-unquote Chinese miracle is being played in Vietnam, in parts of, uh, in the Philippines, and uh, in some other parts of uh, Southeast Asia and Africa as well. So I'm not, I'm not so sure how much really uniquely Chineseness there was there. In what else do you think uh, we boast of uh, that make it uh, very difficult for other developing countries to, cop to copy our experiences in well the process of industrialization? Well, on this occasion of thinking about uh, the role of the Chinese party, uh, it's the, the party, political party, the Communist Party of China, one thing that has done, as I have observed in many other developing countries, that has which I would think is this is out of good heart, and fairness to uh, suggest to other countries is that the Chinese Communist Party focused on building up domestic connectivity. In other words, we, the party provided a platform for every individual, regardless of your age, your educational background, your province, your ethnicity. So, I, so long as you try harder, you learn the language, you, you are not going to be discriminated against. So. Um, that level of uh, playing field for everybody in the society to get ahead through sweating, let's put it that way, but that's really important for many societies. All right, back to Richard for uh, more of his questions. Well, thank you, Young Ray. And yes, the uh, professor's insight there helps us understand one of the significant challenges facing the 19th Party Congress, and that is how to manage the world's second largest economy. According to global investors Goldman Sachs, the theme for China's policymakers is striking a balance between growth and addressing financial sector risks. What I'd like to ask the professor is whether he sees it in the same terms and after what has been a, a strong start to the economic year, whether we can expect a change of direction in the future. I'm not trained as a finance expert, but I would think the general orientation in this country, which again it has been underway for a, a good number of years under President Xi Jinping's leadership, is to come back to the, what's the real economy. Professor, just one more question. We spent a little bit of time uh, on the origins of the reform policy, this the scale of it, the speed at which it took place earlier in the program. In China, every school child knows the uh, late paramount leader Deng Xiaoping was the father of the country's economic reform. Now, 
Professor, you heard me expressing my belief earlier that Deng Xiaoping uh, 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 was the facilitator, not the architect of reform. In other words, he allowed it to happen, and the speed at which it took off was down to the enterprise of the Chinese people. Here's your question, Professor. Do you share that view, or was there a blueprint for economic reform in China? Well, the blueprint is not in the sense of uh, what we call guidance or plan. You know, those words may mean something in different languages. But I would think the, uh, one of these things that uh, people, well, when we look back, especially at the past 40 years of reform, is the quick pace of adaptation. The party, the government agencies, um, when they uh, attune their uh, policies when one policy is proven to be not working as uh, it was envisioned. So in other words, what's normally uh, phrased as pragmatism, as uh, the that eventually would have, have to carry. I would think, uh, I wouldn't call pragmatism because it carries a notion of um, somehow you do it unwilling, un uh, unwillingly. I would think if there was a quote unquote secret to the style of governance here in China with or without a leader like uh, Mr. Deng himself is that you adapt. Uh, the, the, in this case, you, meaning the government, the, the party itself, and then uh, the corporations and the individuals, and you work under, you, you try to uh, leave aside ideology, which we ourselves suffered very badly during the Cultural Revolution. And when we look at the rest of the world today, you see some of these, what's called identity politics, these clashes, even sometimes based on gender, you see the uh, so-called conservatives versus uh, the uh, progressives in many societies. Um, we, we are not laughing at them because we went through a similar stage here in China uh, during the Cultural Revolution years when you know people were competing with each other to see who were the better children of Chairman Mao. <laughs> and we don't want to do that again. So it's adaptation, what should I say, and a shared um, commitment to say we're going to all get this through, stability is more important, uh, tranquility, than uh, this sort of pursuit of a, an ideal that may not be that well informed in the first place. Professor, thank you. And uh, thank you, Young Ray, for the chance of joining this uh, debate all the way over here in London. Thank you so much, uh, Richard and Professor. Indeed, uh, we did have a, a sort of a consensus in the late 70s uh, in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, that is, uh, seeking truth from facts and the emancipation of the mind. Um, uh, Deng Xiaoping, our late paramount leader, did give a second thought to uh, what was called the socialism uh, uh, by the first generation of the communist leadership, Mao Zedong. He said, quote, socialism is not about poverty. Well, thank you again so much uh, for your participation. One question answered and more questions uh, to come in uh, across the line. Questions for the 19th Congress of the CPC special series. Want to know more about the next question, uh, what it is and uh, who raised it from where? Please stay tuned to our next episode of Cross the Line. Questions for the 19th Congress of the CPC special series. Hello and welcome to Cross the Line. Questions for the 19th Congress of the Communist Party of China. I'm Yang Ray in Beijing. For our viewers, both at home and abroad, the upcoming 19th Congress of the CPC is no doubt an event that invokes a lot of curiosity. To appease the curiosity, I'll be joined by our outstanding overseas correspondents to co-host the show. They'll bring us questions and perceptions of the event from a 100% foreign angle. To answer these questions and interpret these perceptions, we are joined in the Beijing studio today by Professor Jia Daojun from Peking University. And in Seoul, our co-host Xin Ham cannot wait to tell us what questions he's going to ask for this edition of the Cross the Line. Thank you, Rang Wei. Well, it's certainly a pleasure to serve as co-host 
across the line. So let's get right into it. The question I delved into about the upcoming 19th Congress of the CPC is this. Is China ready to assume greater leadership in the world as the United States withdraws? For China, the time is now. The United States had been considered by many the world's lone superpower for years. But with the U.S. now focused on putting America first, that could open the door for China to assume greater global leadership. Nowhere in the world is a potential face-off between China and the U.S. more likely than on the Korean Peninsula. So we went out to the streets of downtown Seoul to find out what South Koreans think about China's global position. China has risen since Russia's collapse after the Cold War. I think in the future China will continue to hold its position with the United States as a G2 Asian economic superpower. In my opinion, China has much human talent and has achieved fast development in IT technology. But aside from the economy, I carefully say that the country may need to develop a little more politically and diplomatically. Professor Kim An Guan is an expert in Chinese studies at the Korea National Diplomatic Academy under South Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He agrees the implications of the DPRK threat are far-reaching. In my understanding, the Chinese government approach except uh, the recognize it is a very important regional security issues but the Chinese government also uh, regards that the North Korean threat is not only Northeast Asian issue but also it is a Sino-US strategic competition issues but for China to take on a larger global leadership role Professor Kim suggests change must also come from within. The Chinese government and Chinese leaders have to show they are more people weight in the international community's uh, public goods and show some uh, new values and uh, norms and standards that are in, uh, that are accordance in the the current. Uh, the universal values in the international community. Experts and scholars will be watching very closely to see how China's political leadership and policies take shape over the next half decade. But there's no denying that the country will be a force to be reckoned with in various sectors, including diplomacy, global trade, and environmental issues for many years to come. Shane Hom, CGTN Seoul. Welcome back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shane, for sharing with us uh, how some of the South Korean nationals uh, look at the leadership change in China of the Communist Party as well as the role in the vision of this biggest political force in the world, as well as their perceptions about the very difficult uh, process of denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula. Welcome back, uh, Professor Jia. Do you think China will live up to the expectations of some of the Americans, such as Dr. Henry Kissinger and Brzezinski, about G2, which was very controversial a few days ago, uh, uh, sorry, a few years ago? Well, uh, I would think uh, a G2 format of the China-U.S. deciding what a third party ought to be doing, that will continue to be controversial. I think many quarters of the world will be resisted. But having said that, uh, we do have situations whereby you have multilateral forums uh, we get a good number of them just in this part of the world, in the Asia-Pacific, APEC, East Asian Summit, and what else, um, whereby if you don't have a, an agreement, of, uh, at least a, a consensus between China and the United States, nothing gets done. Um, so you, these multilateral forums become talking shops. Um, then the, what's left for both the Chinese and the American governments to do is to do the groundwork and of uh, preparing the other members to accept a Chinese and American initiative, sometimes jointly tabled, sometimes separately tabled. 
Many world leaders and observers of China's development have placed their hopes on what role China could play, particularly the alleged world leadership that China might assume if you look at the policy speech of President Xi Jinping in Davos. As uh, the presidency of Donald Trump uh, becomes so controversial and is uh, viewed as uh, uh, an effort, enormous effort to de-globalize uh, the world economy. Now, having said this, context, Professor Jia, what do you think of China's readiness, uh, if any, to be the world leader along with the U.S., despite the allegation that uh, President Trump uh, would prioritize American national interests first and foremost? Well, uh, I disagree with the kind of sharp contrast that put out there saying that the United States is withdrawing from the world or is shirking its global leadership. You have to look at uh, a country's participation in international affairs by dividing it up. If you look at America's membership and its activities, activism in international organizations being one of that for any country. And second, trade. Under President Trump, he's emphasizing America first. He wants to narrow the uh, trade deficit America had with some of the uh, economies, including China, but he's not saying America is walking away from trade. Now, investment, American, if anything, the United States companies are very active investing abroad. And last but not least, if you look at troops deployments and uh, you know, sending students overseas for studying, the United States remains on the global stage. Um, China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, is a way of keeping, keep it going with uh, at least the economic dimension of globalization. And let's not forget it. China cannot expect to deliver anything meaningful with this Belt and Road Initiative without a working relationship, a workable relationship, should I say, um, in terms of trade and investment with the United States, which is and will remain the uh, largest economy of the world. So I s think um, you, will have, you will continue to see politicians articulating different kind of sound bites that may be presented as a contrast, but the realities are much more complex. Thank you so much. Professor Dao Daojun, for your contribution to this meaningful dialogue about the role of CPC as well as whether we're going to have a co-evolution between China and the United States in the new century. So much for this part of the discussion. Xian, I hope our discussion in Beijing has at least partly answered the question you have raised in the beginning, except for the denuclearization process in Korea. Tell us your thoughts. Any more questions you want to ask uh, Professor Da Daojun, please go ahead. Well, I sure do. I, I want to ask the professor what his thoughts are about the fact that you have the Chinese leadership over the next five years. You have the U.S. Donald Trump administration in power until 2020. That's quite a long time there. So from what you've seen in Mr. Trump's policies so far over the past nine or ten months or so, what sort of indicators are there that could maybe give us some insight into how Beijing and Washington will maneuver or coexist through the end of this decade? Well, I don't think uh, that China and the United States, even under President Trump now, uh, he's been in, in office for almost a year. I, in reality, Trump's policy towards China, the m I would read the uh, thrust being continuation rather than fundamental change from that of the Obama administration. Um, you would probably see uh, a U.S. military policy that remains to be pivot without the, the name or rebalancing without the name. If you look at the deployment of SAD in South Korea, that being a very good example of that. And if you look at uh, uh, trade and investment, yes, there are disputes. There are, but the bottom line is neither China nor the United States is walking away from the WTO. The WTO remains to be the bedrock of how the two economies relate to each other in trade and uh, investment. It's a little bit of a, uh, uh, should I say, for me as an academic, many of you in the media, a disappointment that President Trump may be less interested in uh, negotiating towards a free trade arrangement or bilateral investment treaty between China and the United States. But nevertheless, um, 
you know, in diplomacy, you never say never. You, they don't rule it out that China and the United States may come up with a more structural arrangement rather than the current project by project uh, arrangement in terms of their trade and investment ties. Well, I think it's also important to point out when you speak of diplomacy, of course, uh, myself be covering uh, the news here in South Korea, the DPRK issue, you have China, the U.S., other neighboring countries, of course. Uh, I think it's safe to say that many of these countries want to see ultimately a denuclearized peninsula. It's a matter of how we get to that point. So how can the U.S. and China use the situation in this region to really work together to find that peaceful resolution, Professor? Well, uh, under you in particular, under the Trump administration, if you look at it, China and the United States are collaborating with each other almost seamlessly at the United Nations. It was so several months back when Chinese and American diplomats openly step, expressed differences under the, such forms as the United Nations. And you have the sanctions and implementation of the sanctions. So hopefully, uh, there you will have more of a a way, well, this <laughs> obviously depends not just on China and the United States. It depends on North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and others as well. Hopefully, uh, the, the uh, road to uh, negotiation, direct negotiations involving North Korea would not be that uh, far off. The, I, if, uh, if we look at Iran as a case uh, as a historical case, there may be a point when the North Koreans would consider accepting um, an Iran type of deal, basically meaning it would uh, freeze its nuclear program to some point and it would allow IAEA to go back in and inspect and in exchange um, you would have a, uh, uh, some arrangements to integrate uh, North Korea to end its diplomatic isolation, both on a bilateral basis and bringing it, uh, offer its membership in some of these um, multilateral organizations. So hopefully that will, they would not be that long uh, down the road. Well, that is the hope. Professor, uh, really appreciate your views and insights. And thank you, of course, Mr. Yangri. Always appreciate speaking to you. A very enlightening discussion indeed. Gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, Shane. I really appreciate uh, this uh, rare opportunity to co-host with you. It's a big pleasure. And thank you, Professor Da Daojun, for your participation. Uh, one question answered, and more questions uh, to come in our Cross the Line. Question for the 19th Congress of the CP series. Want to know more about the next question and what it is and who raises it from where. Please stay tuned uh, for our next episode of Cross the Line questions for the 19th Congress of the CPC Special Series. I'm Yang Rui in Beijing. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>